On Friday, the muffled bells of Dunblane Cathedral rang out at noon to mark the death of Queen Elizabeth II, this country's and the Commonwealth's sovereign for the past 70 years. It has been a remarkable reign in so many ways, partly due to its great length, embracing years of great social and technological upheaval, but moreover due to the late Queen's extraordinary commitment to what she saw as a God-given call to serve the people of this country and of many other nations. Many of us have never known another British monarch. She's always been there as our Queen, dependable, wise, gracious, and clear in speaking of her Christian faith and of the profound influence of the life and the teaching of Christ upon her life. Now a beloved queen has passed through our midst, and a nation truly mourns. A new reign has begun, and as we gather to worship today, we shall give thanks for Queen Elizabeth II, and we shall pray for King Charles III, and for all the royal family. The news of the queen's death broke just before Ruth Kennedy's ordination here in Dumbleen Cathedral on Thursday evening. And that service began with a minute's silence as we remembered Her Majesty. But then we moved on to the celebration of Ruth's gifts and her sense of vocation, marking the beginning of her life as a minister of word and sacrament. And I'm delighted that the Reverend Ruth Kennedy is preaching at this service, and even more delighted that she will be joining us as a pioneer minister working with the under 40s in the parishes of St. Blaine's Church and Dumbling Cathedral along with other congregations within this community. The psalmist wrote, You who dwell in the shelter of the Most High and abide in the shadow of the Almighty will say to the Lord, My God and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Let us worship God. Psalm 121, I to the hills will lift mine eyes. St. Paul wrote, Things beyond our seeing, things beyond our hearing, things beyond our imagining have all been prepared by God for those who love him. Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, who is the same yesterday, today and forever, a much-loved queen has died and a nation and commonwealth mourn. An era has ended, and many wonder at what lies ahead. Reassure us as we gather for worship that you are the King above all kings, whom death itself could not hold, nor time diminish. 
Help us, as did the Queen, to place our trust in God and to discover that God is our refuge and our strength, a very present help in trouble, the solid rock beneath our feet. As we remember a long life of dedication and service, we confess those times when our dedication has worn thin and our service has been weak and fickle. As we remember a life shaped by the life and teaching of Christ, we confess that too often our life is not shaped by Christ, but by the voices that encourage us to have more money or power or our own way, even when that way brings hurt or harm to others. Forgive us, God, and with your Spirit's help, enable us to walk more faithfully. Lord, your kingship surprises, for it is found in a manger and upon a cross. And in this light, all earthly monarchs shall find the wisdom to rule as your servant Elizabeth did so memorably. Enable us to value her ministry in the way we serve one another, that she who reigned over us may live gloriously with you for a, through Jesus Christ our Saviour and Lord, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Our first reading today is taken from the Old Testament, the book of Jeremiah, chapter 4, verses 11 to 12, and then 22 to 28. At that time, this people and Jerusalem will be told, a scorching wind from the barren heights in the desert blows towards my people, but not to winnow or cleanse. A wind too strong for that comes from me. Now I pronounce my judgments against them. My people are fools. They do not know me. They are senseless children. They have no understanding. They are skilled in doing evil. They know not how to do good. I looked at the earth, and it was formless and empty, and at the heavens, and their light was gone. I looked at the mountains, and they were quaking. All the hills were swaying. I looked, and there were no people. Every bird in the sky had flown away. I looked, and the fruitful land was a desert, all its towns lay in ruins before the Lord, before his fierce anger. This is what the Lord says. The whole land will be ruined, though I will not destroy it completely. Therefore the earth will mourn, and the heavens above grow dark, because I have spoken and will not relent. I have decided and will not turn back. Amen.
Our second reading today is from the letter to Timothy, 1 Timothy, chapter 1, verses 12 through to 17. I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has given me strength, that he considered me trustworthy, appointing me to his service. Even though I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man, I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. The grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly, along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. But for that very reason, I was shown mercy, so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his immense patience as an example for those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. Now, to the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honour and glory for ever and ever. Amen. And may the reading of God's word be a blessing to us today. When I started to prepare for this service, I had no idea what the week would hold. None of us really did. Yes, my ordination. And please accept my heartfelt thanks for your prayers and support for that evening, a very special and poignant time. Yes, that I would be speaking and giving my first sermon as the Reverend Ruth Kennedy to you. Yes, we expected the announcement of the new Prime Minister, but the passing of the Queen this week was not anticipated. And our tributes are prayed from all around the world. It is obvious that her life of serving and loving God and others impacted lives and nations in deep and meaningful ways. Perhaps, like yourself, I have my own memories of the Queen. On the 30th of June 1994, my school marked our tercentenary celebrations involving a visit from Her Late Majesty the Queen and the Duke of Edinburgh. We lined the hallways both inside and out and clapped and cheered and greeted her with waving the flags. I remember being quite awestruck as she walked by, full of unhurried grace. A planned visit, expected in that sense like the numerous engagements around the world during her long and full reign. And now here we are, with unplanned laments for a life so well lived, awaiting the news of all the arrangements, the details of which are preciously planned to give honour to a remarkable monarch of integrity and faith. So often, it is in the smallest details we find the greatest treasures. And for those treasures to shine brightly, they need to be well placed in the overall plan. In her Christmas speech of 2000, the Queen reflected, for me, the teachings of Christ and my own personal accountability before God provide a framework in which I try to lead my life. The Queen knew her role in the sovereign plan of God was to serve him and those entrusted to her, reflecting Christ in all she did. 
the finer details of which became apparent on every engagement, address, conversation and correspondence written. And this helps us as we live, trusting in God in the same way. This enables us to hold it in tension, the known overarching plans and unknown exact details. As a community of faith across Dunblane, we are venturing into pioneering ministry with the under 40s. It is what I am sent here to serve with. There is an overarching aim or plan to share the gospel with those unconnected with existing church communities and grow new ways of worshipping relevant to their contexts and lives. Reaching people who have never and possibly will never enter a church building but who are interested in exploring faith, life issues, and walking a life with God. Possibly in un ways that are unfamiliar to our usual form of worship, and yet still connected with the family of God, even though their point of contact may not be on a Sunday gathering. And if that vision seems devoid of exact detail, you would be right. The nuts and bolts can only really take shape when we listen to each other and those out with the church to hear the stories, learn of the gifts, skills, talents and passions and respond in contextually relevant loving service. That is not to say, of course, that this has not been happening. Far from it. But much like our politicians announcing plans to tackle current challenges which we face, we, as church, must also continue to be honest about the difficulties that we face so that we can rise up with godly, creative approaches and turn that which once irritated us, like a grain of sand in the eye, turn that into a positive irritation, like a grain of sand beautifying a pearl in the oyster. Our readings today and reflecting on the Queen's life of serving others encourages us not to think of our internal challenges first, but rather consider the issues others face, those not in the church, who do not yet know the goodness of God, the love of Jesus, his peace, mercy and grace. The words of Jeremiah are spoken to the people of God about his coming judgment. The people are refusing to repent, preferring to remain with their backs turned to God. And in this sense, these words can help us relate to people who keep their backs turned to God, whether they have never heard about him or they struggle to believe or for whatever reason. The young prophet's vivid description of a life is one devoid of God. There is a lack of knowledge, wisdom, and the goodness of God. There is chaos, darkness, and no order in a dry and barren land. There are no people no singing birds, no sign of life or hope. This is a catastrophe of immense proportions. This idea of immensity 
is also utilised by Paul in his letter to Timothy. Before his encounter with the risen Christ on the road to Damascus, Saul, as he was then, was a blasphemer, a persecutor, and a man of violence, the worst of worst sinners. He was off the scale. Paul paints a portrait of his life without Jesus as harsh, constantly fighting and striving, no peace, turmoil to the point of violence, chaos, no love, darkness, a catastrophe of immense proportions. Quite contrary to the life he knew with Jesus. And if I think of people I know who are ignorant of God, meaning not that they are ignorant, but just they don't know God yet or they don't believe. If you think of those that you know, sometimes life is good for them. And we pray that to be so. But I also notice a turmoil without the light of hope. And I am pained for them. Perhaps you are too. I believe God is. I believe that God does not want us or our neighbours to be in a place of chaos with no sign of life or hope. Instead, through the work of Christ on the cross, we are offered a life of fullness, joy and hope. The metaphors we heard in Jeremiah are completely reversed. The land is overflowing with milk and honey with the knowledge and wisdom and goodness of God. Fertile ground is teeming with healthy creation, including birdsong. That's life and legacy. Minds are peaceful and hearts hopeful and light-filled. We have help in times of trouble and have a sovereign God in whom we can trust. This change from chaos to peace is only possible by the favour of God that we do not er deserve nor cannot earn. And that is his grace. Grace. Is that not the prayer that we might say at mealtimes? Well, I'm not sure how it is for you, but I rarely get the opportunity to say grace in our home. My sons usually beat me to it. It's as though that they think I will pray for far longer than they will, delaying the filling of their stomachs with the plate of hot food. I have no idea where they get that idea from. But no, I do not mean the mealtime blessing that we might pray. Grace is the inclination and the nature of God to treat people far better than we merit. To be merciful beyond comprehension. We see the grace of God at work when we think of the first miracle of Jesus, turning water into nearly 900 bottles of wine at the wedding in Cana. Why would they need so many bottles of wine after they drank the initial amount? I suppose it might depend on how much you like the wine. Extravagant grace. And grace is more than outrageous favour. It is an influence of God working in us to equip us for a godly life. On writing about Pauline theology, Dunn states grace is defined not only as the past act of God initiating into a life of faith, but also present continuing experience of the divine enabling and commissionings. 
It is not simply an attitude, but the act of expressing the attitude. God shows us his grace in our personal lives, to the church, to the wider world, to whomever he pleases. And the challenge therein, how are we showing the same grace? When we consider pioneering ministry to the under 40s, how can we initiate acts of extravagant grace? Thinking back to overarching plans, God's plan is to trust even a man like Paul, to trust his church, even full of people like us, to love others by the power of his grace. His plan is to entrust us with the gospel of Christ in this day and age, with all the difficulties we face in church and in wider society, we are to hold out our grace-filled hands to help in acts of loving kindness, in prayer, in comfort. This winter, that may be to share our heat when we can, and that this is the good news of Christ, that he and his church care and action that love and compassion in meaningful and practical ways. Our late Queen modelled this in more lives than we will ever know, and it is something that we can do too. The immense grace of God causes us to notice how essential it is to reach those beyond our church community with this good news. Not to correct behaviours or assume that we know best, but to sit with them and walk with them. I might find myself cycling or running with them. You might too. It is to be a presence of God's grace with them. And in that gentle space, work with the plan of God and let the mystery of his grace be known. Let us pray. God of grace, we thank you for your extravagant favour towards us given and shown at your initiative, in your Son, Jesus. Help and empower us with your grace to live in ways where others can see and know your presence and favour towards them. Father, let your grace abound in us. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us pray. Almost unnoticed by us, the carousel of days goes round. And then, like today, suddenly the whirl, whirl of life is stopped. And in the silence we turn to you, Lord God. As we do so, our thoughts are of thanksgiving. For we are grateful as we consider the long years of service by Her Majesty ever with us through each unfolding chapter of our nation's story, through light and dark, through blessing and scarcity, through crisis and calm, always the steadying presence. We are grateful for the interest she took in this community of Dumblane and for her presence within it during some of its darkest and most difficult days. For us, at this time, there is the shadow of mourning. Our loss is great, but we know that having trusted in you, our sovereign will not miss her reward. And so, we are comforted. And thus strengthened, we ask your blessing upon those most nearly touched by her passing.
the Princess Royal, the Duke of York, the Duke of Wessex, the Duke of Cambridge, the Duke of Sussex, and all their families. And especially we pray for Charles, our new King, and the Queen Consort. Bless and fortify them, we pray, for their new responsibilities. And guide us also, that we may play our part in the building of a fit nation, ready to play its part in the fellowship of the world. And so in this day of thanksgiving and reflection, we pray, let Her Majesty's example of dignity, integrity and service to others be our inspiration for the days that lie ahead. And let us all dedicate ourselves to the task of continuing the noble legacy she has bestowed. And we pray this day for Ruth Kennedy as her work as a pioneer minister in this community begins. Bless her with insight and with vision, with patience when it is needed, and holy impatience in seeking new signs and shoots of your kingdom. Let her find support and encouragement from the congregations at St. Blaine's and here in Dumbling Cathedral and elsewhere within this community. Bless her family as new responsibilities bring fresh demands on her time and her energy and give to her that balance of life that enables her to be faithful to her calling as a daughter, a wife, a mother and as a minister and give to her time to care for herself and to allow her soul to be nurtured and refreshed. We pray too for all who are ill, in hospital or at home, and those who are drawing to the close of this life. We pray for those who are in pain or tortured in mind or spirit or frustrated by disability. Let them find healing and strength and the sensitivity and support of people around them. And we give you thanks, God of heaven and earth, for the communion of saints, for that great company of heaven, which includes people we know and have loved, who rejoice with you in a greater light, who see you face to face and join in heaven's great eternal banquet. All our prayers we ask in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The hymn for all the saints who from their labours rest.
in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, knowing the love of God and surrounded by the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. And may the joy and blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son and Holy Spirit be with you all today and always. Oh.